In this video, I'm going to cover um, a class assignment for my structural equation modeling class that just talks about basics. So this will cover um, essentially how do you draw a structural model, what do they tend to look like, and some of the basic rules for structural models. So I've made this assignment and it will be available on stattools.com very soon. And um, the first thing that we're going to do is pick some types of variables. So we're going to build a structural model. It could be a CFA, it could be a path model, um, it could be a full model. But the first rule is uh, for this assignment is to create two latent variables. So latent variables are represented by circles uh, in a structural model. So I'm going to insert some shapes here. We're going to start with some circles. Okay, so I've got to have at least two latent variables. So circle one and circle two. So I could call those any particular thing, um, <clears throat> but my research area is words. So I'm going to call this one uh, semantics. Go over here. And then call this one associations. Well, close enough. Um, and so now that I have my two latent variables, I have to come up with some kind of way to measure them. Right? And so that's where this manifest or observed variables comes in. So manifest variables are the ones that you actually have a column for in your data set. They're actually measured, so you can call them observed variables. If you're working on a confirmatory factor analysis, sometimes they're called uh, indicator variables. So the terms are kind of fluid, it depends on who you're reading, who's going to use them. Uh, I generally tend to use manifest variables, but observed variables makes a little more sense because those are the ones that are actually measured. So I'm going to create three little variables here. Whoa, thanks word. So I'm going to do more than three um, variables. I'm going to do three indicators for each one. So I've got three variables for my semantics and three variables for my association. Now those can be measured with a bunch of different things um, and I won't bore you with a bunch of symbols that you won't know what they mean but let's say we have three questions for each one. Uh, the next thing it says I have to have is some sort of covariance or correlation relationship. That's usually between your uh, latent variables, and it's usually a curved line. So I guess it would be better if I did it with this one. There we go. <clears throat> um, to indicate that they it could go either way. So uh, covariance relationships mean that I don't have a directional hypothesis. They're just they're related to each other or they're correlated. Uh, covariance is the unstandardized solution. Correlation would be in the standardized solution. So I know these two things are related, so I'm going to say that they're correlated. I also have to have directional relationships where I force one to be x and one to be y. If we're doing a traditional CFA, I believe the latent variables cause the effects on the manifest variables. So I'm going to make the uh, arrows go to from the latent variable to the manifest variable, which indicates that I believe whatever this underlying latent is, is what causes the relationships between the variables, so the covariance tables, or if you want to think about it more generally, it's what causes the answers on those variables. Think about a questionnaire. Okay, so why do people answer for on this question? Well, it's because it's a semantic relationship. Okay. So I did that for both of them. So those are directional arrows. They only have one head. So that indicates that this the latent variable is the cause, and these uh, variables are the outcomes. So all my endogenous variables should have error terms. All right, so what does that mean? So endogenous variables are ones that have arrows coming into them. So all of our squares here are endogenous. Exogenous variables are ones that only have arrows coming out. So my two latent variables are exogenous because the directional path leads away from them. It's exiting. Endogenous is coming in towards it. So error error terms 
are also represented by circles. We're gonna make them small. Usually they're made kind of small. Sometimes you'll see them as little um, D's for disturbances, but generally represented by little circles. <clears throat> when you create a path picture, or I'm sorry, a structural picture, now, in publications, they're not always present just to help keep the diagram readable. But we've got our little errors. And what we're going to do is add directional arrows from the error into the square here. And so why would the arrow go into the square? Well, remember that anything that's a circle is not represented by a measured variable. So all my circles, even the error here, are not in the data set. There aren't columns that I have to tie the squares to. And so what that implies is that the error is also part of the manifest variable, because they are, right? So manifest variables are measured, and we're going to try to account for the um, communality or the overlapping variance between them by using this latent variable. Well they'll have other variants left because we're not perfect at this. So the variance that's left over is error. And so we have to represent that on our picture by using these little circles um, to represent the error, the leftover variance, or sometimes called the unique variance um, that is part of the manifest variable that we can't account for. Okay, so those error terms help us um, explain the rest of the variance in the model. All right, I'm gonna skip this one just real quick and talk about include markers. So uh, the markers are the way that we scale the, um, for estimation purposes on structural equation modeling. And it's also a control for um, degrees of freedom to make sure your model is identified. So what'll happen is we'll have to either scale some of the questions or uh, scale the latent variable by setting the variance to one. Uh, the standardized solution is always the same no matter which one you pick, but the estimates will be different depending on if you scale a question or a latent variable. I tend to scale the manifest variables, the questions, I call them questions, sorry, the manifest variables. It could be items on a scale or it could be an entire questionnaire. Um, let's just have it because I do a lot of CFAs. Um, but either way, I tend to scale on the manifest variables and then use the standardized solution because it didn't matter which way I scaled um, if I use the standardized solution. All right, so to do that, what I'm gonna do is insert some little text boxes here. So I'm gonna scale on the manifest variables by saying this one's gonna be set to one. So it gives it a good scale. I'm gonna set this one over here to one. It does not matter which one you use. And then I'm going to make sure all of my error variances paths are also set to one. And that's a requirement so you don't estimate a path to the variance, I mean, from the variance to the manifest variable, because that wouldn't make any sense. You, then you were basically setting it as another latent variable. Um, and so what we want to do is just estimate the variance. So that sort of forces the model to only estimate the variance of the little circles, which is your error, instead of a path and a variance. Otherwise, your degrees of freedom will be all sorts of crazy. Okay. All right, so I have scaled my variables. Now let's go back and estimate degrees of freedom. Okay. So the way, the easiest way to do this is to talk about all the things that we're going to estimate. Okay. So first thing, we have um, one, two, three, four regression paths. Uh, this, these two with the ones don't count because they were the marker variables, and these over here don't count because they're also markers. So I got four regression paths. I got one, two, three, four, five, six error variances. I have one covariance path. And then the variances for my two um, latent variables here. <clears throat> so if I've done this correctly, which every once in a while I, I don't, so let's hopefully we did. Uh, I should have 13 estimated parameters. Okay. 
Now that is not my degrees of freedom. That is the number of parameters that I have estimated. What are my possible parameters? So that is going to be p times p plus 1 divided by 2, where p is the number of squares. So I got 6 squares times 6 plus 1, which is 7, oops, divided by 2. And I'm not always the best at math, so let's do 6 times 7, right? So 42 divided by 2, so I got 21. So I should have 21 minus 13, 8 degrees of freedom left. Um, and so that would be my degrees of freedom. I could check it when I actually run the model, make sure it matches. Um, I always suggest people doing this because um, there are things that get estimated that don't necessarily come out in the output that you may not know that it's doing. And it's always helpful to know um, what your syntax is doing or if you are estimating it wrong. <clears throat> All right, so is my model over or under or just identified? It is over-identified, it means I have more degrees of freedom. Under-identified means that it has negative degrees of freedom, which would be bad, it wouldn't run. Just-identified models do run, but that's where the degrees of freedom is zero, so it's not always the most helpful thing because you'll tend to get a perfect solution, which is great if it's actually perfect, but generally it isn't. All right, so the last part is the model recursive or non-recursive. And this is very confusing because recursive models do not go back. Non-recursive models do. So um, it's sort of backwards. And I would say that this model is recursive because none of the paths sort of circle back on each other. <clears throat> and so that is just some basic ideas on how to draw a structural equation model, uh, how you would estimate degrees of freedom, and a little bit on scaling.